Hi and welcome to the fourth episode of the Neuroendocrine Cancer Nutrition Series. This episode is on sugar, cancer and ketogenic diets. So in this episode I'll be telling you the difference between diets which contain different amounts of sugar and carbohydrate. Um, so first up, we've got the no sugar diet which has resulted um, from the sugar feeds cancer myth that I'm sure you've heard about. The sugar feeds cancer myth uh, likes to keep rearing its ugly head unfortunately um, and uh, in most cancer diagnoses this is one of the things which people hear about. Um, basically all cells require glucose as an energy source. You can get glucose from a variety of foods, not just from carbohydrate and you can even get glucose when protein and fat are broken down too. We know that a few cancers are partly caused by high sugar intake. Um, our governments do quite a good job in reminding us of this and we're told to cut down sugar to avoid cancer. This doesn't mean that eliminating sugar can be used as a treatment in those cancers or any other cancer um, once the cancer is formed. These are two dramatically different areas of science. For example, if 10 cakes a day cause cancer, not having 10 cakes a day wouldn't treat it, would it? Um, we also don't know the cause of most types of neuroendocrine cancer at all. So let me be clear, cutting out any kind of sugar from healthy sources such as fructose, glucose, um, from fruit or, or soft drinks, or from sucrose in processed foods and sweet pastries will not starve your cancer. Cutting out foods which break down into glucose during digestion, such as potatoes, pasta and bread, will not starve your cancer. Cutting out absolutely every source of glucose, all food, carbohydrate, protein and fat, and having no energy source for your organs and muscles to function will eventually kill you. More importantly, the inevitable anxiety of trying to completely avoid all sugar creates stress. Stress then in turn um, turns on fight or flight mechanisms, increasing the production of your stress hormones that can then increase your um, blood sugar levels and could possibly suppress um, your immune function. Both of these things may reduce any possible benefit of eliminating sugar in the first place. There are plenty of people making money from this myth and some patients choose not to listen to the team that specialise in their type of cancer and they would rather listen and believe someone who has no knowledge of their diagnosis. When we as health professionals hear about someone cutting out sugar and following a no sugar diet or any other unproven diet, our heart sinks. It's really upsetting for us as we know the diagnosis and treatment that they're about to go through is hard enough without making it more difficult and unpleasant um, with no actual gain. Undoubtedly there's an element of controlling one's destiny here and of course people have the right to take on board what they wish. For me personally, I want my patients to live the happiest life they can and if all you can eat during chemo is something like ice cream or sorbet or you look forward to that big piece of cake every afternoon, then so be it. Don't live in guilt, it's really not worth the worry. So secondly, there's very low carbohydrate diets, so not no sugar, no carbohydrate, it's just very low levels. Perhaps it's sugar's relationship to higher insulin levels and related growth factors which may influence cancer cell, cell growth the most and increase the risk of other chronic diseases. Some types of cancer cells have plenty of insulin receptors, making them respond more than normal cells to insulin's ability to promote growth. Some of those cancers have been studied in regards to a diet which reduces carbohydrate intake to a very low level but it increases fat to a high level. This is called a ketogenic diet, which you may have heard about. It's long been used in um, children to treat epilepsy where they don't respond to their drugs. Um, and it's now being used in other cancers around the world, um, including things like brain tumours. If our body doesn't have access to glucose, it will eventually start to produce ketones in the liver from fatty acids and amino acids. Ketones are things which are given off um, in someone's breath 
Um, something you may smell on your morning commute when someone doesn't have their breakfast um, or they've been out drinking the night before or if, they're, um, if they have diabetes. Um, those in the UK, um, just imagine a bad smell, um, a bit like pear drops, um, but a bad version of that, uh, which are the sweets that we can get here. Um, the success of the ketogenic diet is tumour dependent. There's no research with ketogenic diets and neuroendocrine cancer yet. Plus, there are so many different types of neuro neuroendocrine cancer cell um, expressing different receptors, different amounts of receptors. It will take a long time for this work to actually have a potential benefit in anyone if it is done, even if it's planned right now. Since we have no research, I don't personally practice the ketogenic diet at all. Um, the long-term effects of these diets in anyone um, with cancer or not probably increase things like cholesterol and the risk of other chronic diseases um, just because of the high fat content. Um, you will have also watched episode two in which um, you hear that cancer increases your protein requirements. Um, so any potential diet, um, any potential ketogenic diet would possibly have to swap out some of that fat and put more protein in it and it's whether that would work as well. So thirdly, there are the low added sugar diets, also known as classic healthy eating. Patients do worry about having sweet tooth and having one cancer doesn't necessarily mean you won't get another one in the future. And so I think I'll probably do a separate episode on the suitability of healthy eating in general in neuroendocrine cancer. Having a level of added sugars within the normal healthy range of eating is okay if, if it's achievable during your treatment um, and your weight isn't dropping. On a separate note, in diabetes during a cancer diagnosis, most health professionals in your diabetes team will loosen the target range for your HbA1c, A1c. If you have neuroendocrine cancer and you're fit, well, without any horrible net symptoms and the weight's not dropping off you, it may be appropriate to follow the normal range, which everyone else does. Um, in the UK, it's 6.5% or the 48 figure. Um, sugar intake and management of insulinomas and glucagonomas is a very different story um, and I'll be doing different episodes on those two types of neuroendocrine cancer. So that's it for this week. Um, see you next Wednesday for the fifth episode of the Neuroendocrine Cancer Nutrition Series.